Hello everyone, bună seara, dobre vecher. Uh, tonight we continue with our uh, uh, public program of Eduard 2020 project and we uh, host uh, uh, researcher and professor of history of art from Zurich Art University, Jörg Scheller, who will uh, uh, who will present the lecture Eastern Europeanizing Globalization, Polish art around 900 as a case study of today. <clears throat> Just uh, to remind that uh, we are about to finalize our course of contemporary art and curating and the last two modules are dedicated to the way we create um, uh, conditions uh, for presenting our work publicly. Uh, the way we research and teach about art history in general and uh, specifically local art histories. So our um, our interest during these two models is um, very much related to the context in which we work as artists, as curators and researchers, and uh, uh, the way we communicate about our work uh, uh, to the others. Um, so thank you, York, for accepting this um, invitation and uh, i i give you the word <clears throat> thank you so much thank you for the invitation glad to do this second presentation within the framework of your um, program um in this lecture i will present and discuss um, selected polish artworks or artworks from poland as well as Polish exhibitions at the Venice Art Biennial as examples um, for the globalization of Central and East European art in the context of large scale exhibitions. And the second step, I will um, highlight some inherently global aspects of visual art from that region um, around 1900. Um, art that is not or um, not so often perceived under the umbrella concept of uh, globalization. That is, I will try to um, show that even stylistically um, conventional art from um, the Poland around 1900 for instance, history paintings, landscape paintings, um, or folkloristic art and design are part of what um, we today associate with um, globalization and related phenomena such as migration, diaspora, transculturality, hybrid identities, uh, etc. The lecture consists of uh, two parts, roughly. In the first part, I will um, give some, um, make some general remarks concerning my methodological approach and the terminology I am using. And the second larger part will refer to the aforementioned Polish artworks and exhibitions. So, Obviously, I start with the first part and give you some um, more general background information about methods and um, terminology. So when I'm speaking about globalization in the following, I will focus on what I would like to call two hot phases of globalization, namely the time around 1900 and uh, as a comparison, the time around 2000, our uh, time. Um, in recent times, much attention has been paid to the latter phase of globalization, that is to um, the phase after 1989. Um, so mostly when we talk about globalization, we talk about this recent uh, history, and this is also true of um, the art world. Um, paradigmatically, um, I show you 
this exhibition curated by Hans Belting and Andrea Budensieg in 2011-2012, The Global Contemporary Art Worlds After 1989. So that is quite paradigmatic for the discourse on um, globalization. And um, in this exhibition, it kind of seemed as globalization and what they called global art, whatever that is, um, had emerged suddenly only after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this is why um, I would like to focus in this lecture more on the time around 1900 to shed some light on the deeper history of globalization while of course um, I'm still referring to our time comparing um, the time around 1900 to our um, own uh, era of globalization. And I think this is quite uh, important because globalization cannot be limited to you know, the uh, proliferation of neoliberalism uh, after 1989, not limited to the post-communist condition or the rise of the internet and the rise of transnational um, markets. Um, as the philosopher Peter Sloterdijk has pointed out, Globalization involves at least three major phases, um, which of course, um, one should add, overlap and, and interact. Um, but roughly, um, Sloterdijk argues that globalization can be divided in these three phases. Um, first of all, the intellectual globalization that already took place in antiquity when philosophers conceived of the world as a globe. Um, uh, B, uh, the terrestrial and maritime globalization, when um, Chinese, but then especially uh, European um, explorers yeah, set out to um, explore and conquer uh, the globe, the Chinese, um, refrained from doing so. so in the 15th century they burned their ships and remained in china while the european explorers set out to um, colonize um, the world and see the third phase of globalization the most recent um, phase would be the economic financial and technological globalization that um, began in the 19th century, maybe even the 18th century, but um, accelerated thoroughly in the 20th and 21st century. Um, there's another term that I would like to mention um, as a complement, critical complement to globalization, namely the term mondialization. Um, it was coined by the Austrian philosopher Jens Badura and by mondialization, he refers not only to what he calls physical and spatial aspects, but he um, refers to um, our increasingly hybrid life worlds. Yeah? So that takes into account the social and political um, as well. Um, the mundus, uh, the Latin word mundus is um, uh, if there's the basis, the etymological basis of mondialization and um, the mundus is the human, the cultural uh, sphere, whereas the globe is just um, the spatial uh, sphere. So in the following, I will talk about globalization for the sake of simplicity, but always bearing in mind mondialization uh, as well. So um, before I uh, said that I will be speaking about two hot phases of globalization, um, uh, because obviously um, globalization is not a linear uh, process. It is characterized by varying um, uh, grades of intensity or temperature, metaphorically speaking. And in this regard, the phases around 1900 and the phases uh, around uh, 2000, they have much in common when it comes to overall acceleration, technological uh, revolutions, scientific progress, increased mobility, urbanization, 
and at the same time, um, for instance, widening income gaps, um, return of uh, military conflicts after relatively long phases of um, a peace. So there are some parallels between these two uh, phases around 1900 and uh, 2000. And by parallels, I do not mean that they are the same. It is always very uh, difficult and problematic to make these historic comparisons. But I think that they both are characterized by um, this accelerated um, globalization. Um, the late 19th century went down in history as the so-called um, Gilded Age in the United States and as the Belle Epoque in uh, Western Europe. And recently, the American political analyst uh, Kevin Phillips has named our present age the Gilded Age II. You know, so he believes that we are again in some sort of a gilded um, age. And at the same time, many um, commentators from Europe have pointed out parallels between pre-World um, War I Europe and um, today. Uh, already in um, 1930, German art historian Alfred Kuhn wrote in his um, book, Polnische Kunst von 1800, bis zur Gegenwart, Polish art from 1800 until today, um, about late 19th century Europe. And I quote, the bright sun of peace between the nations shone on Europe in the late 19th century. Political and social antagonisms seem to have leveled, at least for the educated ones. Progress through education was the slogan of uh, the day. That sounds very familiar um, uh, regarding the diagnosis that we have heard in the 1990s from um, uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, the political philosopher from the United States, who spoke of an end of history, about the victory of the trias liberalism, capitalism, uh, democracy. So, um, in this, also in this regard, there might be um, some uh, parallels, this gilded age, this, this idea that um, history has somehow um, reached at least a preliminary uh, end point and progress has um, succeeded. Um, when we look at the art world, in comparing these two phases, it is striking that um, both phases have seen a strong increase in uh, the number of large-scale uh, exhibitions. So in the second half of the 19th century, world exhibitions um, were on the rise. So they grew uh, exponentially. Um, and uh, precisely these world exhibitions um, were among the inspirations the, insp yeah, the inspirations for the Venice Biennial that was founded in 1895. Um, and similarly, or comparably, um, the second half of the 20th century has seen a strong rise and exponential growth um, regarding the number of um, biennials of contemporary art. So really the uh, biennials or the number of biennials kind of mirrors the um, increasingly uh, globalized uh, world or the interconnected um, world. And although most of the newer art biennials are decidedly pluralistic, inclusive and transnationally oriented, it has been argued that they remain deeply rooted in Western uh, mentalities. The Taiwanese art historian Chin Tao Wu, uh, for instance, states that, and I quote, um, the biennial, the most popular institutional mechanism of the last two decades for the organization of large-scale international art exhibitions has, despite its decolonizing and democratic claims, proved still to embody the traditional power structures of the contemporary Western art world, 
The only difference being that Western has quietly been replaced by a new buzzword, global, quote end. So that's a rather uh, pessimistic uh, look on the proliferation of uh, art biennials. I would still argue that it is a little bit more um, complicated and of course that the biennials are reinterpreted in local terms uh, all over the world. But still there is some truth um, to it. It's a model developed in late 19th uh, century uh, Europe that um, has become um, um, a super important and super topical um, format all over the world. So in a nutshell, large scale exhibitions have been a very important catalysts for the globalization, the synchronization, the harmonization maybe of contemporary art from various places, but they also have uh, become platforms for the staging of differences, local, regional, national differences, and accordingly um, local, regional, national um, identities. So it's, um, it's a two-sided coin, as every coin is a two-sided. So as windows to the international and the global public, they have provided and they continue to provide opportunities for countries, institutions and individuals to communicate, agitate, politicize through art. For instance, uh, in the case of Hungary, that is um, quite interesting uh, case study when it comes to art and politics around uh, 1900, um, because Hungary built a, a national pavilion already in 1909. Um, that is, um, before becoming um, an, an independent um, or a sovereign nation state. So here, art anticipated the political reality. Uh, it was used as, um, um, as a catalyst for a political change, if you a more recent example, for instance, is the case of Zimbabwe. Um, the Zimbabwean curator, um, Rafael Chikukwa, who in 2011 initiated um, uh, a national Zimbabwean pavilion at the Venice Biennial, not least to criticize the former Pan-African pavilion. So there was a Pan-African pavilion in Venice, which of course is, uh, must feel a little strange for the participating our, um, African uh, artists and curators, like in every uh, country, in small countries such as Belgium, have their own the pavilion in Venice, whereas African participants are kind of like collectively organized in this pan pavilion. And now that has uh, changed, yeah, obviously. And in this context, it's interesting to observe that in the first Zimbabwean exhibition in 2011, um, the, uh, I think she was already the end, the, the director of the National Gallery in Harare in Zimbabwe, Doreen Sibanda, highlighted the importance of the national uh, precisely in the context of globalization. Um, and I quote, I feel it is a national duty to take part in global events like the Venice Biennial Zimbabwe cannot shy away from taking part in global events like the Venice Biennial, quote end. So here the national and the global appear as the two sides of the same um, coin. And I will come back to this double bind um, later. So we could say that comparable with the effects of modern financialization um, as described by the sociologist Georg Simmel in his book, The Philosophy of Money in 1900, the ongoing biennialization generates homogenization, homogeneity and particularization, um, um, a desire for difference at the same time. And this dialectics is embodied by the Venice Biennial, uh, so-called mother of biennials um, uh, perfectly especially in her early phase around 1900, the uh, biennial combined 
but universalist superstructures, um, which referred to uh, Western humanism, um, uh, for instance, in, in the texts accompanying the first exhibitions. Um, and it had an international exhibition where artists from several countries participated jointly. But then quite quickly, these national um, pavilions emerged in uh, the Giardini, the historic exhibition um, site. Um, so today we could say that the um, Venice Biennial um, presents herself as a chronotope. It's a um, notion by uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, um, comprising different phases of exhibition history um, with early national pavilions, early 20th uh, century, um, postmodern exhibitions in the Arsenale, um, where there is no more national uh, order and contemporary, like genuinely contemporary approaches to creating, um, which is basically the dissolution of the exhibition space throughout the city of uh, Venice. So exhibitions taking a place in, in, in all sorts of places. So when you go to um, the Venice Biennial, you not only see art exhibitions, but you also see um, an exhibition of exhibition history. So you go from the early modern national nationalist modes of exhibiting art um, to the postmodern ways of exhibiting art to the genuinely the contemporary um, modes of uh, exhibiting uh, art. And in this regard, the uh, Venice Biennial is quite unique uh, because the old national pavilions have not been demolished. So you can actually um, get a comparative uh, perspective there. You can compare um, these strategies, modes, ways of um, uh, doing exhibitions, staging exhibitions at the Venice um, Biennial. And in this um, context, um, the Polish exhibitions um, provide particularly interesting case studies um, when it comes to the connection between globalization and East uh, European uh, art or Central East European art would be the more precise term when it comes uh, to Poland. So um, the, the history of the Biennale um, comprises four major periods in the history of Poland. That is also something quite unique. No other um, large-scale exhibition um, really um, has this. Um, because um, when the Biennial was founded in 1895, um, that was the final stage of the partitions of Poland. Um, so when Poland was ruled by Austria, Prussia, and Russia, um, then it comprises the so-called Second Republic between uh, 1918 and 1939. Then um, the time under Soviet rule um, after the Nazi occupation, and then the time of the so-called uh, Third Republic after 1989. So um, basically when Poland became an independent uh, country uh, again. So that is uh, quite uh, unique that you have four, um, the four major phases, modern phases of Polish uh, history somehow comprised in the biennial. The time of partitions, the Second Republic, the Nazi and Soviet rule, and then the Third um, uh, Republic. And um, since Poland um, did not exist as a sovereign state for the most part of the 19th and 20th century, it is common knowledge that art and culture played a major role for the perseverance of the Polish imagined community, as Benedict Anderson um, uh, puts it. Um, so uh, that is um, maybe like trivial to say, but maybe I should uh, add it that um, since Poland did not exist as a sovereign state, sovereign nation, um, it was so like a meta country, um, a meta a Poland in art, culture, language, music, um, etc. 
And precisely in this uh, connection, uh, large scale exhibitions um, such as the Venice Biennial or the Arts and Crafts Centered Galician uh, State ex Exhibition of 1894 uh, uh, come into play. Um, it's interesting to observe that um, uh, Polish artists or artists, artists from Poland, it's always um, hard to, to say um, what actually was, was the case. So Polish artists and artists from Poland, Polish uh, or artists of Polish ancestry have participated in the biennial from 1897 uh, uh, onward in solo shows and in international group shows and in special Polish sections comparable with those that had been uh, previously established at the world fairs. Um, and last but not least, also in the Polish pavilion, obviously that was built in 1932, already 1932 in um, the era of the so-called Second um, Republic. So from very early onward, Polish artists participated in the Venice um, Biennial. But also, um, of course, in other large scale exhibitions such as the uh, Galician uh, exhibition, um, um, but it is, I think, crucial to, um, to, um, to see that only with the biennial, um, the Venice biennial, did Polish um, artists really um, officially appear on the international um, uh, scene. So, um, and even I would say only really with uh, beginning with 1920. So then they became part of this, um, this official national representation again that took place in the, uh, at the biennial. So for instance, in 1920, the Polish ambassador in Rome, Konstantin Skirmund, um, did not exaggerate when he wrote to the general secretary of the biennial, Vittorio Pica, and asked that Poland shall be represented in a dignified way at her first participation in the Venetian exhibition, the most important art exhibition in, in the world. So there you see that it was um, super important, particularly from this um, um, occupied and marginalized um, countries such as Poland to be officially represented and to officially participate in these large-scale um, exhibitions. So you could say that in, in 1920, after um, the regained independence of Poland, um, uh, Polish art became part, like officially, of this uh, of the of the emerging art world, the globalized uh, art um, system. So in Venice, it was, um, for instance, possible to place the then marginal and economically weak Polish state in the center of power um, uh, already in the 1930s. Yeah? So at the time when Poland as a, as a nation was still um, uh, quite challenged and quite fra fragile in uh, many uh, regards, so they still had this, this uh, pavilion in the Giardini sending out a strong signal to the world that like Poland is, is, is back, it's back on, on the scene, it's participating at an uh, equal par with the other uh, European um, nations. Yeah? So art and architecture were, anticipate, uh, were used to anticipate uh, the desired political and economic uh, power. So we can see that um, exhibitions, and especially large-scale exhibitions, do not only serve as mirrors um, of political conditions, but they are veritable political, political agents. Yeah? So an exhibition is a political uh, agent, um, especially when it comes to uh, exhibitions such as the, the Venice Bayern. Um, so we could speak of um, exhibition agency or exhibitions and agency um, 
with regard to um, Geld's famous uh, art and agency. And these large scale exhibitions are particularly um, political um, simply because of the sheer size and um, the involvement of various stakeholders um, because due to this sheer size, they inevitably um, transcend the sphere of the arts. Um, so um, um, this is something that is quite crucial when it comes to large scale exhibitions. They are politically um, motivated, they are economically motivated, they are touristically motivated. So there are many, many, many fields uh, involved in the organization of a large scale exhibition of um, uh, contemporary uh, art. Um, so when it comes to uh, Poland in um, 1920, the organizing committee of the Second Polish Republic presented 145 works by 31 artists in the pavilion um, of, of Germany, actually. So the first um, exhibition of Polish artists in the Venice Biennial took place in um, yeah, the, the pavilion of the defeated um, um, uh, state Germany. Um, and at that time, and for uh, the uh, Polish participation, the question of national distinction was of major importance. As uh, Katarzyna Nowakowska Sito uh, underlines, she writes in the 1920s, the problem of national distinction was solved primarily by placing emphasis on elements of folklore that would always contribute an individual flavor. In the hands of artists like Władysław Skoczywas, Zofia Strienska, both represented at the Biennale in 1920, or Jan Szczepkowski, who tackled it not only for its exotic subject matter, but also for its original form, born of folk inspirations. This was always well um, received. Um, quote end. So it comes as no surprise then that many works in the Polish exhibition featured folkloristic uh, elements and um, be it only through references to the Carpathian um, mountains and the Tatra region in landscape and uh, genre paintings. So this was um, the, the local, the localized element in the exhibition. And when, it, uh, as for the Tatra mountains, it's, um, Important to note that from the late 19th century um, onward, Polish intellectuals and artists had traveled to the remote mountain regions of Galicia. So that was the part of uh, Poland um, governed by, by Austria. Um, and these remote regions, um, they sought um, to create a truly Polish aesthetic by referring to uh, the architecture and the dresses of the indigenous um, Gurale people uh, and also other indigenous uh, people such as the, the Hutsuls. Um, so it's interesting to see that the emerging Polish national uh, style, the so-called uh, Sakopane style, um, was actually derived from um, the um, uh, the costumes and the aesthetics in general of some um, local indigenous um, mountaineers. Um, rather than being genuinely um, national, this so-called Zakopane style, um, Zakopane is a city in the Tatra region. So the so-called Zakopane style was part of a general uh, retro modernist tendency throughout Europe that started with arts and crafts and the vernacular revival um, and that led to the Art Nouveau and the uh, Jugendstil. Um, a similar tendency under uh, different aesthetic and ideological auspices 
manifested itself in two neoclassicist sculptures by Henrik Kuna um, that greeted the biennial visitors at the entrance of the Polish exhibition. So this is still the exhibition of uh, 1920. On the left, there was um, Yuchenka, um, that means dawn or aurora, a female marble torso from 1919 that in the context of the uh, Biennale was to allegorically um, evoke the dawn of the Second uh, Republic. Again, the idea behind the artwork was specific of the cultural, political and social circumstances in Poland, um, whereas the aesthetic clearly was part of a general international trend, um, namely the retour à l'ordre in the art scene after the First World uh, War. Um, yeah, so this is um, when comparative art history um, as developed by Piotr Piotrowski comes into play. Uh, I talked about this uh, yesterday. Um, it's interesting to see that um, inside the pavilion, we have this folkloristic um, um, modernist paintings referring to the Tatra uh, region. But at the entrance, we have this classicist um, style, which at first sight has nothing to do um, with, with Poland, with the specific uh, local circumstances or local uh, traditions. Uh, however, um, it's not that easy because at that time, um, there were um, attempts to uh, e Italianize Poland um, as it were. Um, and to somehow detach Poland from the Slavic uh, sphere. So um, these attempts culminated in 1939 in an essay by Jan Parandowski um, entitled Polska leży nad morzem śródziemnym, uh, meaning Poland lies on the Mediterranean. And in this text, Parandowski wrote, and I quote, um, of all the Slavs, the Poles are most Latin. In saying so, we neither disown our origin, but we definitely disown the so-called Slavonic spirit. Our culture has not the same borders as our political state. The East is as far from us as if the ocean um, flowed in between. Spiritually, um, Poland lies on the shores of the Mediterranean, quote end. And that is quite interesting when it comes to the discourses about um, globalization, because here we have a, a disjunction um, between the, the locality in a um, quite concrete understanding um, and the locality in a meta understanding. So you can live in Poland um, in the 1930s um, near Russia, near the so-called, as he calls it, a Slavonic sphere, and you can still belong to um, uh, the Mediterranean culture. And in such like dialectics, in such shifting um, hybrid identities, in such contestations, I see um, an anticipation of our present day globalized art world in which specific social or political issues are meditated, uh, and mediated through unspecific media and uh, styles, uh, so global uh, forms, if you like. Um, so uh, where um, categories of identification are constantly negotiated dissolved and sometimes reinforced or re reassembled. So globalizing Eastern European art um, should always include the explication of the globalization which took place even before the, the term globalization obtained its current meaning, um, which was in the 1960s. Um, and um, precisely in contexts in where we would not expect it in the first uh, place. 
So I see this folkloristic and neoclassicist art of the 1920s as aspects of modern globalization. Um, and the same could be said of something such uh, 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 allegedly boring as late academic salon art at the Venice uh, Biennium. Uh, so for instance, the, the academic um, history painter Henrik Schemiratsky, for instance, he uh, was invited to the Biennial already in 1897. And he is listed in Joanna Sosnowska's book about the Polish participation in the Biennale um, as a Polish artist. But when you look at the, uh, uh, the book about the Russian participation in the Biennale um, published in 2013 by the Stella Art Foundation, Henrik Szemiradzki is counted among the Russian artists. Uh, one artist uh, sometimes come on, uh, counted among the poets, sometimes uh, counted among uh, the Russians. And here we see that um, none of the categories actually fits that um, here actually a transnational um, identity uh, begins to emerge precisely around this time um, of uh, 1900. So Shiamiratsky considered himself as a Pole, but he led a truly cosmopolitan way of life. He was born in the Ukrainian part of the Russian Empire. Uh, he had worked in Izhchaukov, he studied in St. Petersburg, he traveled extensively through Europe and he lived in Rome, I think from uh, 1872 um, onward, that is, he lived there permanently. Uh, in Sosnovska's book, his name is spelled um, Henrik um, Schemiratsky. Do I have the spelling here? Yeah. Um, Schemiratsky, in the Russian book, uh, book he is called um, Heinrich Semiratsky. Um, and this is quite typical for uh, artists from Poland around 1900 that participated in the uh, Venice Biennial. Um, uh, for instance, Włodzimierz Szerzewski, um, he participated frequently in the Biennial in the late 19th and early 20th century. He was born in Brest, in the Russian part of Poland, but he enrolled at the Munich Academy of the Arts as David Szereszewski, uh, that was in 1883. Later he became Vladimir Szereszewski, and later he called himself Wojimierz Szereszewski when he sent works to the Galician um, State Exhibition. And uh, Szereszewski lived in um, Venice permanently, and he always presented his works in the international section of the Venice Biennial, never in the Russian or uh, the Polish uh, section. And again, in Sosnowska's book, his name is spelled Wojimierz Szereszewski, the Polish um, name, in the Russian book, Vladimir Szereszewski. So I am telling this to show that present day catchwords from the debate on art and globalization, such as shifting identities, cultural hybridity, or art and mobility um, should not be restricted to the postmodern and uh, the current times. It's precisely the time around 1900 that must be taken into account uh, as well. Because precisely at that time, we find these hybrid um, identities and these multiple uh, belongings that um, are so typical of today's phase of globalization, um, even despite Corona. Maybe Corona will put a uh, we'll put an end um, uh, to this and we all move back into our uh, national zoos, um, who, who knows. So in his book, um, Rodzina Europa from 1961, um, the Polish Nobel Prize winner um, Czesław Miłosz wrote, a quote, in a certain sense, I can consider myself as a typical Eastern European. Somehow it is true that his specific otherness the inner as well as the outer can be traced back to a sort of amorphousness. 
My example makes sufficiently clear that it takes great efforts to handle contradictory traditions, names, and an excess of impressions, that is, to put them in a certain order. Quote end. And um, one could add today, um, if we agree on the nexus between globalization, hybridization, transculturalism, um, in a way, today, everybody lives in Eastern Europe, as um, portrayed by uh, Miłosz. Um, and be it only with regard to our uh, still so-called um, national um, football um, teams. So what I'm trying to show here is that in a, in, in a way, uh, Eastern Europe, as uh, Miłosz describes it, is no longer restricted to, to Eastern uh, Europe. This amorphousness that um, Miłosz associates with um, Eastern uh, Europe experiences around 1900 um, is something that is typical and characteristic of uh, today's uh, world in, in general. And the hybrid biographies like Shemiratsky's, Sheryshevsky's, and also Miwash's can be understood as prefigurations of the postmodern and present day so called global artist, um, you know, who moves from place to place, to residency to residency, um, uh, etc. So you can think of the arguably prototypical postmodern American artist Andy Warhol whose family was actually of uh, carpatho russian origin. So they came from, from Eastern uh, Europe. Comparable with uh, Sheryshevsky, uh, Warhol changed his name, namely from Andrew Varhola to uh, Andy Warhol. Um, I think he, uh, uh, even, at one point in time, he even tried to convince his assistant, Bob Colacello, to change his name into Bob Cola to make it sound more uh, American. So here we also have like this um, shifting and changing names. And comparable with Shemiratsky, Warhol uh, combined quite heterogeneous positions in his oeuvre and became what could be called you know, the, the major salon artist of global liberal consumer culture. And when I say that Shemiratsky's work is genuinely hybrid or heterogeneous, um, this is obviously despite its anachronistic character. He painted in his late salon style, late um, academic history painting style. But still, it anticipates much of what is now considered as typical of hybrid contemporary art. So Shemiratsky uh, combined a broad range of influences from academism, impressionism, and realism. He amalgamated history and mythology, fact and fiction. He appealed to an international uh, audience, while at the same time he openly or latently referred to very specific cultural and local um, issues. For instance, this monumental oil painting that you see here uh, 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 was displayed at the Biennale in 1897. Uh, 1897. Uh, it shows the Emperor Nero as he looks at a half naked female Christian martyr in the Roman Colosseum. And this scene could easily be understood as an allegory of the situation in partitioned in partition Poland. Um, which was at that time often regarded as a Christ of nations or as the martyr among the European uh, nations. So we have um, a political subtext here, despite this being a sens sensationalist and a spectacular blockbuster artwork, if you like. So Shemiratsky, and in a way really like comparable to, to Warhol, um, he shifted smoothly between aesthetics and politics, you know, pornography and morality. It's a quite pornographic um, a painting in a way. Between blockbuster aesthetics and historiography, between international styles and patriotic gestures. Um, 
um, just like the Biennale itself oscillated between these poles uh, back then. Um, so when we compare this, um, I'm just let me briefly uh, check how I leave this out. Um, one thing that I uh, would like to mention is um, that this, um, <coughs> well, I, I leave this out. That is, um, it's too much. So I would like to to um, compare the situation again to the um, to the time around uh, 2000 by showing a more recent exhibition at the um, uh, Venice Biennale, um, namely the Polish participation in 2011. And here I would like to point out some um, differences, but also uh, some uh, continuities. So some of you probably uh, know this. Um, project, it's quite uh, famous. So at the um, uh, 54th Venice Art Biennial, um, Biennial in 2011, the Israeli artist Yael Bartana presented her Jewish Renaissance movement in Poland in the Polish pavilion, a half fictitious, half realist activist movement that lobbies for the return of 3.3 million Jews to as Bartana uh, Jews um, to their ancestral homeland, as Bartana calls it, yeah, that is to, to Poland. And Bartana's aim was to remind of the more diverse um, social conditions in Poland before the Second World War, when many Jews, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Germans lived on uh, the Polish uh, territory. And her project. Um, clearly illustrates um, that um, you know, the, the biennial was always a political exhibition, but it was um, never, uh, at least not in the beginnings, it was uh, not very explicit. It was more, more subtle. Um, and today, the uh, respective exhibitions can be much more overtly um, political, which, which is clearly uh, the case here. Um, so the exhibition carried the title and Europe will be stunned and it consisted of uh, three highly stylized films that not only dealt with but uh, even emulated uh, modern totalitarian propaganda uh, aesthetics. So they referred to and they evoked collectivism, utopianism, messianism and martyrdom. Uh, topics that were uh, very viral in the first half of the 20th uh, century, uh, obviously. In an interview, the artist stated, quote, I felt like if I want to talk about the early 20th century, I would also like to talk about the aesthetics of that time. The use of aesthetics is very simple, very direct. Leni Riefenstahl was a huge influence, the aesthetics, not the ideology. A quote end. So I'm not sure if one can distinguish so easily between aesthetics and ideology, between a medium and message. And I'm also not fully convinced of Bartana, Bartana's um, mimicry as critique. Um, however, um, her project certainly was convincing um, as, and I quote Bartana, a way to shake people and to awaken them from their post-historical hibernation, as it were. Um, so for me, the topicality of pre-war and wartime Western and Eastern Europe was the actual subject of this uh, project. Uh, the artist used the large-scale exhibition um, of contemporary art as a platform for artistic art activism in the context of middle, uh, Central and Eastern European uh, history. And in this regard, uh, again, her project um, was congenial uh, of the Venice Biennial, which has always been a, at least latently um, political um, exhibition. So I consider And Europe Will Be Stunned as an attempt to show that history is never historical, that it always keeps coming back 
that the the specters of the past still haunt us. That is the specters of the past, the late 19th and early 20th century. And that the discourse on the end of history, which emerged um, in the 1990s, was maybe a bit uh, short-sighted. So a crucial point is that uh, in her artwork, or in this art project, Bartana conceives of history in global dimensions. Um, along the overlappings of past and present. Uh, for instance, she once uh, stated that, and I quote again, the Third Reich and the Holocaust are not just historical events, they also have long-term global chain effects that reach into the present um, day. And this is precisely what I'm interested uh, in uh, here. Thus, uh, she also reminds us that globalization, which is currently mostly associated with Nike sneakers, McDonald's burgers, tourism, biennials, the internet, labor migration, multinational corporations, etc., cetera, um, has a lot to do with war, um, forced migration um, and, and stuff and stuff like, like this. Yeah? So even our allegedly uh, mutual indifferent global markets have not fallen into our laps, um, but emerged in a very aggressive way. For instance, when in the 1850s, the United States of America forced Japan out of isolation and into the capitalist market system uh, with the help of some cannon boats uh, and a little shelling of harbor um, buildings. So this is what I, uh, what I wanted to, to uh, show in, in, in this lecture. Um, that the early Polish participations in the Venice Biennial um, show strong traits of what we today associate with globalization, with the hybrid identities, with um, um, mobility, with um, um, also like forced migration in, in many ways. And also with the more aggressive origins, the war uh, origins of today's um, globalization. So um, uh, I think it is salient to, to complement the focus on the most discussed aspects of globalizations, uh, globalization with its less excessive and perhaps less conspicuous uh, features such as Polish uh, folkloristic paintings from around 1900 or um, academic salon art from the same time uh, uh, and region. And then compare it to, for instance, um, projects such as Barta Nas, who kind of combined these two uh, aspects by going back to the um, less known inter and pre-World War I um, periods shedding some light on uh, Poland's Jewish heritage, so the more, the more diverse heritage of, uh, of the country. Um, yeah. So that was it um, basically, um, a tour d'horizon uh, um, through the early Polish participation and globalization and discourses. And I am, Happy to take your questions if there are, if there are any. Thank you very much. Um, if uh, any of the participants would like to address the questions, please do so. You can uh, write in the chat or just speak up. Um, Um, I think we, on behalf of uh, Moldova, we can uh, we can mention also our participation <laughs> in the Nice Biennial, but at a much later stage uh, and uh, without having a national pavilion. But uh, if I am not mistaken, um, it started around 2012, maybe 11 when suddenly Moldova had three representations in the Venice Biennial. Mm. 
and uh, all of them were privately organized or somehow curated. <laughs> uh yeah, yeah. and um, it it was like a kaleidoscope of artists <laughs> and of different uh, economic uh, and artistic uh, with different economic and artistic background <laughs> and some of them were quite influential in the mm -hmm. of culture obviously because oh, yeah. Moldova is not was never um, was never uh, officially having a pavilion in the Venice Biennial and uh, was never uh, paying the fee to participate in the... Oh, yeah. oh, it's, uh, it's quite expensive to participate. I think at that time it was about 50,000 euro to yeah. be part of the exhibition. And yeah. uh, so these fees were covered by private sponsors or uh, individuals. Hmm. Uh, one interesting uh, case was that one of the exhibitions took place in the Romanian Cultural Institute. So there is oh. a sort of uh, uh, entry uh, door for Moldovan artists to Venice Biennial. And also when uh, Romania is organizing the competition for Romanian artists to be represented in Venice, uh, Moldovan artists can also apply actually. There is no clear restriction that mm -hmm. uh, Moldovan artists are excluded or not able to submit at least to try to submit a project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I find it really fascinating um, to have a, a, a closer look on the East European participations in the Venice Biennial because when I started dealing with um, uh, globalization and globalization discourses and the philosophy and the cultural history of um, uh, globalization. Uh, Eastern Europe hardly ever is mentioned. Like people like to talk about, you know, like the transatlantic uh, slave trade, about um, uh, the European conquest of the so-called New World. We talk a lot about China, and we focus a lot about a lot about like Southeast Asia now and, and stuff like this. So these are key constituents of globalization discourse, and um, all the phenomena discussed in this context, um, I find. In, um, in 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 East Europe, um, um, just just like uh, uh, um, just just the same in a way. Yeah. So that, there, I became really interested, and that was one of the reasons uh, for me to to manage a research project on the um, on, on East European pavilions at the Venice Biennial. So we had this research project in in, in Zurich because. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it, it used to be a blank spot in the globalization uh, discourse, the way I see it. So especially when it comes to these hybrid identities, yeah, like not belonging, not clearly belonging to one nation state um, or to one like, like really like fixed culture. But yeah, what uh, Jesuit Miwash described as this, this amorphousness. And we are, at the moment, everybody is, um, um, very much aware of the world becoming more amorphous and the identities more hybrid and multi-layered and stuff like this. And I think in this regard, uh, in a nutshell, there is a lot to learn from the East European experience. Um, there's a lot to, to gain from this. I want to add also about uh, Moldavian Pavilion. If we speak about in the Soviet Union, I also make some research because Moldova was a part of the Soviet Union. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the pav pavilion of USSR was uh, built uh, Shusev, and he was born in Kishinev, original from Kishinev, but uh, became famous in Moscow. So we mm. have a pavilion, but we have person <laughs> from Moldova who built this pavilion there I, and for me it's uh, quite fantastic things <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes and also i make research that uh, during the ussr uh, representative of his artist there are no one from moldova from okay. republic of moldova <laughs> wow just like this <laughs> no no one at all no Crazy. Maybe need to uh, to make deeper research, but from internet and to see some uh, list of the artists from different uh, years, there are no one uh, from Moldova. Okay, 
Interesting. And can you imagine why? <laughs> it's a question. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in, 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 interesting that uh, how I feel for my generation and uh, it's not some like task or so interested and uh, for example, I never dislike interest being this by this by by penal. Uh, because um, for me, for example, more interesting have deals here, some local deals, and uh, create my uh, discourse here. And uh, it's for me, I have some personal task with my friends, something that's interesting for us. And um, for example, this Venice uh, PNL. And uh, this uh, word uh, scene, uh, you somehow should participate in all this competition, some run, something uh, show that need, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a bit boring because you start uh, like um, form you for, for this uh, condition that uh, need for curators for uh, all this. Yeah. And I, 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 know, I, I don't say that it's bad uh, and uh, if somebody propose uh, i really will think but i mean like some task that uh, and uh, zone of interest um i think now n not exist so big uh, interest to this uh, competition or how what is it it's festival no. uh, the, in 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 my circle and in my generation i don't know maybe some artists in moldova still interested uh, but uh, what i see around um, Something changed how I feel. Mm. Yeah, I think for for the Polish artists, it really had to do um, um, with really becoming visible on the international uh, map. And for the Polish authorities, um, it was important to somehow like um, send out the signal to the world: we are still there. We want to become like autonomous, sovereign again, and in this context, the Venice Biennial was super important. Like as I said, it was always a political exhibition, not not really a propaganda exhibition, but more a diplomatic exhibition. So like these national pavilions are like um, are like embassies uh, in a way, and you would meet the right people, and you would build um, transnational or international networks, and you could participate in the international art market. And, and stuff like this, but still, they always kind of used some some local flavor. Yeah, in, in the beginning with this folkloristic stuff, and even these neoclassicist sculptures were meant to be like genuinely Polish because yeah, Poland belongs to this Mediterranean culture, as it, as it was stated, um, uh, as it was believed by some um, protagonists at that time. And this I find very interesting. There is so much like transnational and um, transcultural um, stuff going on, while at the same time it's decidedly a uh, national and it's uh, decidedly like mainstream politics and stuff like this. And I'm interested in how these fields interconnect and how they are interwoven. And um, in this regard, I think also in this regard, these exhibitions are quite topical and quite symbolic of what we have today, because today we're in a situation, everybody speaks about globalization, everybody speaks about transnational corporations, multi, uh, multinationals, uh, etc. But at the same time, we have more nation states than ever before. There have never been so many nation states. Yeah. So that, that's a simultaneity, a field of tension that I'm, that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And I, I think it was really uh, actual, actual uh, when it uh, was not so many ways of uh, some communication and distributing uh, and be visible, because uh, now every artist I think can create personal uh, way of uh, promotion and to find uh, some colleagues or some unions uh, of people uh, and not uh, depends from uh, from where you and because uh, now some so many opportunity uh, and if before uh, we really uh, have this uh, just some these events that uh, give to, to us this uh, opportunity mm, now now it's really question 
Владимир, you want to present something? No, I just wanted to start uh, with ourselves so that it's more like a discussion. But uh, I wanted to comment to Maxim's uh, uh, intervention about willingness or not willingness to participate. I think uh, this is uh, when, if we, you look at it uh, in this national, from national perspective, national state perspective, then uh, obviously artists today are rather independent artists are rather reluctant to represent through their work their the idea of nation or national state so probably this is something that uh, is um, is um, kind of counter perceived as being counterproductive uh, in the independent art practice uh, but uh, the example that York shows uh, with Yael Bartana, it, it seems like uh, for that kind of work you needed an exhibition like Venice Biennale to to basically this is like uh, a, 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 the right context for this kind of work to be so, yeah. so this is like a different logic of um, why we participate in the Venice Biennial is because maybe sometimes we need this specific context to present our uh, work. Uh, mm -hmm. So this, in that sense, I, I find it like as a good example, as interesting example of uh, intervening into this political uh, dialogue with yeah. a big work of art. But I have one question, because basically what you say, Jörg, is that um, we all are participating in the globalization. We are a part of this uh, mechanism and it's not, it wasn't happening just now after the fall of Berlin Wall but exactly. it started 100 years ago. Well, for Moldova, maybe it, it started later, but still we are part of this uh, process and we contribute to, to, to a kind of uh, uh, a narrative which is the, um, also very pa power related, let's say, like participating in Venice Biennial, we also contribute to, to some sort of uh, we build a he cultural hegemony and we are participating in this process. And um, mm, because then, then in this regard, participating in Venice Biennial is like a continuing a colonizing project or do, do you think uh, there is any connotation like that? Because not all countries again are represented in Venice, not all nations are present there or able to show their work. Mm. So us by a country or as individual artists by being there we sort of contribute to this excluding uh, mechanism further yeah but it's 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 two mechanisms at the same time because it's it's an, an, an excluding mechanism and it's an including mechanism and that makes it so hard to to create to, to criticize because for instance when i talk with the, with the colleagues from zimbabwe um for them it is it runs counter to the colonial idea. Well, they want to be in, in, in Venice and they want to show the works there because um, African nations have been excluded. And also for them, um, maybe the nation state has different connotations, more positive connotations, like, like deciding somehow um, about your own fate and somehow organizing your own uh, surrounding, your own environment, uh, uh, stuff like this. So it, it really depends who participates for, for which um, a reason. Some participate to, to deconstruct the logic of um, the nation state. For instance, when you look at the exhibitions uh, in the German pavilion, um, most of them um, in the last years have been attempts to deconstruct the logic of national representation. And, um, and then again, you have maybe younger nation states. For them, it's rather important to, to you know, um, to become visible on the map, on the global map, as uh, as nation states. Then sometimes, as with um, with Zimbabwe, it was also a private initiative in the beginning, and only then the state um, joined in when they saw that some work had been done already. So it's, it's quite diverse and I think the situation has gotten much more diverse with, um, you know, like this plethora of little exhibitions in, in the city. So the Biennale now really consists of these three layers that I call this chronotope. 
So the early um, nationalist representations, the postmodernist transnational representations, and then, yeah, like this plethora of um, like micro -exhib exhibitions and collateral events and, and stuff like this. Um, but when you spoke of um, Moldova, I, I would say like, when I look at the history of Moldova, um, it is a very, it also, it anticipates this, um, say the, the culture of globalization. Because I mean, there were like the, the Hungarians, there were uh, the, the Ottomans, there were uh, the Russians, there were uh, Jews and Germans and, and stuff like this. So in a way, the history of Moldova is, is much more diverse um, than the history of Germany, for instance, yeah? which uh, for a long time was rather homogeneous. But when you look at Sweden, it's all, it also was for a long time very um, um, homogeneous. And when we define hybridity as a key characteristic of globalization, uh, as Homi Baba and, and others have done, then I think the, the experience of Moldova is, is quite close to this experience of um, globalization in terms of hybridity and amorphousness. But that, this is how I see it from, from the outside, obviously. Are there uh, more uh, comments or questions to, to tonight's presentation? Um, I think uh, it's also time to end. Uh, we kind of run out of time. Uh, so, York, thank you very, very much for both days. It was really great to have you with us. And um, thank you, thanks to all the participants. And uh, yeah, we look forward to see you again back in Kishno, better physically, if not at least virtually. And um, let's hope next year will bring us more opportunities, uh, which will work out. So, yeah. I would love to be back. You know, I told you I fell in love with Kishno for for some for some reason that I cannot really describe. So, yeah. So let's um, let's have a great evening, everyone, and uh, see you soon, sometime. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.